So we are going to learn more about hormones, menopause, and hormone therapy with an expert who I'm so honored to have on the podcast today. Her name is Dr. Carla Di Girolamo and someone who I have been following for a while now with great respect. And I discovered her through the Feisty Menopause Network, led by Dr. Stacey Sims and Celine Yeager, who is the host of the Hit Play Not Pause podcast, which you all know and that I love and, and follow with passion. And if this is the first time you've been hearing any of these names, please go check them out and jump into these communities. If, if you like mine, you'll love theirs too. And I'll have links to all of them in the show notes. Dr. Carla is a double board certified obstetrician gynecologist and reproductive endocrinologist who has dedicated her career for women through all stages of reproductive life. And she's also a North American Menopause Society certified menopause practitioner and a lifelong athlete, CrossFit level one trainer, certified nutrition coach, and member of CrossFit Health. So she's really been in the fitness industry, either as an athlete or an instructor for over 30 years. So she's got loads of experience in the lifestyle and nutritional needs and challenges of both athletes and just anyone trying to improve their general health and fitness. She was also recently named to the MedFit Medical Advisory Board, and she specializes in all aspects of infertility care. So she is not your regular kind of doctor, but truly someone exceptional. And that's why she's been voted for now five consecutive Boston Magazine Top Doctor Awards from 2019 to this year. She just got uh, in, uh, that been voted that as well. So this year, so congratulations on that. And she's really hands down amazing. The doctor you always dreamed of having. Now, Dr. Di Girolamo actually holds consultations on Zoom, which she will tell us more about later. And regardless, you will want to subscribe to her newsletter, Athletic Aging, at athleticaging.blog. And uh, I know you're going to love that. So much information. I'm super excited. So now without further ado, let's meet Dr. Carla Di Girolamo. Welcome. Thank you, Zora. What a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And it's great to be here today. Have I said your name right? You say it better than I do. I love it. It's great. <laughs> it's, I, I have to put a little Italian accent on it or something. <laughs> yeah, that's the proper way it's to be said. Um, the American uh, pronunciation is Di Girolamo, but all of my friends from South America and from Europe pronounce it the uh, the traditional way, which I absolutely love. Oh, good, good, good. Thank God. Thank God. So listen, when I started podcasting in 2020, I was covering aging and longevity for, for men and women. And, and, and as time went on, I, I, I just kept getting more requests to cover hormones and menopause. And, and now we're pretty niche here in this area. And, and now that I'm 52, of course, I am also super interested in the topic myself. And, and what I've noticed is that the content of Hack My Age has been part of this explosion of information on menopause in our society, which is a great thing. But sometimes the more that we learn, the more we're confused. Like, is hormone therapy good? Is it bad? Who's it for? When should we start? If at all, is it too late? Is it really protective? You know, why isn't my doctor talking to me about it? Like, goes on and on and on. So, you know, I've been following you through the podcast that you do with Celine, your presentations at the Feisty Menopause events. That's when I think I first saw you there and your blog. And I really like your take on, on, on all of this from your allopathic perspective and would like you to clear some of the confusion for us. So the first question I have is, is probably the one that I get asked most about. And it's the one that I had myself. And it's, is this safe? Um, and, and, and I, I get this because so many people go, oh, well, this causes cancer. So yeah, I'd love for you to explain a little bit like why we're hearing this message and, and is it really safe? Well, that's a, that's a great question. It's probably one of the most common ones that I get myself. And it's with any medication, whether it's a medicine, vaccine, or whatever, what the first question is, is, is it safe for me? And the reason that's important is because hormone therapy may be very safe for some people, but it may not be so safe for others. And so the job of your healthcare provider who is prescribing it is to do a risk benefit analysis. Now, in general, 
women under the age of 60 within 10 years of menopause with no specific increased risk of like say blood clots or no personal risk of cancer, typically are, it's, it's very safe for those individuals. Um, and within those individuals, you know, for indicated things, you don't just put people on it just for no reason. There are very specific reasons to go on it. For example, it is the most effective treatment for hot flashes. And it is very effective, very safe for that indication. A lot of women come to me and say, okay, well, I'm in this category. Should I just start it? Just, I'm not feeling any symptoms, but to promote longevity. Well, we have found that there is really no benefit for just starting it. And there could be risks to taking it without a specified and studied indication. So there's a lot of moving parts in the answer to that question. But in general, if you're having hot flashes, if you're trying to prevent osteoporosis, that's another FDA uh, approved indication of, um, of uh, estrogen therapy, uh, then yes, if you're under 60, within 10 years of menopause, it is extremely safe. Mm. Interesting. So you said there would, there are some contraindications. So for people who are at risk for, for cancer, that's something like you're, you have a history of it in your family or, or is there something else to that? No, actually the risk is in people who themselves have had a cancer diagnosis already. So there's a big distinction there because then you have people, you have people who have had it, and those are the people you typically want to avoid hormone therapy, but it's not a 100% absolute. If I have somebody who's had a history of cancer, um, I will follow up with their oncologist and have a conversation with the oncologist because you don't know about the tumor. The tumor could have estrogen receptors. It may not. It might have just been a carcinoma in situ. I have a woman right now who I'm treating with hormone therapy um, in conjunction with her oncologist. She had carcinoma in situ and it's safe for her, but it may not be safe for somebody who has had a history of invasive cancer. Um, in women, and this is becoming more and more clear as they study it in women who have even the BRCA mutation, that is a genetic heritable mutation with like an 80% chance of cancer attached to it. We've all probably heard of BRCA, even in people with a BRCA mutation who have not had a personal history of cancer, hormone therapy has been shown to be safe. Um, in women who have a family history, but maybe are not BRCA, uh, it's been shown many, many times that hormone therapy is safe, even in someone with a family history. Now, if I see some of those risk factors and I'm putting someone on hormone therapy, I make sure they have a mammogram before I put them on the treatment. Because these hormones don't usually cause a new cancer to form, but what it can do is it can worsen something that's brewing there already that you don't know about. So in, in all my patients over 40 in particular, with some of those other risk factors, but no personal history of breast cancer, I'll make sure they get a mammogram before I start it, and then yearly mammograms after that. Oh, wow. Okay. That's very interesting. I, I, I don't think uh, my doctor certainly didn't do that and, or, or suggested doing that. I think that's very, very useful information. So I would say, you know, the next question I have is, well, for actually before I ask the next question, but you mentioned um, people who cannot take hormone therapy. So if you have the breast, you have breast cancer, then what do those people do if they have the hot flashes and all these menopausal symptoms on top of that, they're freaking stressed of, mm -hmm. you know, the, their condition as well. There are some non hormonal, um, uh, treatments for hot flashes. Uh, some of the, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, those are like antidepressants. Um, they can work very, very well to mitigate hot flashes. Sometimes people use gabapentin, Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of gabapentin. I would only use that as a last resort. It's a very old, old drug. So it's got a, a good safety record, but it can have some side effects. So <laughs> you treat one thing and you create other things. So gabapentin isn't my first choice, but usually where I go, if I have someone that can't take hormones is I go to the, uh, some of the antidepressants in the serotonin uh, inhibitor classes. And it's not because a lot of people say, oh my God, my doctor prescribed uh, an antidepressant for me. They think I'm crazy. I'm not really experiencing these symptoms. It has nothing to do with that at all. What it has to do is the biology of how antidepressants work. They happen to work on a hormone system in the brain that 
can mitigate the hot flash biology going on in the brain. So it's a specific treatment affecting a specific hormone pathway in the brain. So it's not that anyone thinks you're crazy. Mm -hmm. It's that the serotonin reuptake inhibitors really do help hot flashes. So that's probably my first non-hormonal go-to um, in somebody who can't take hormones. That, that makes me think then uh, how much does stress actually play a role in the hot flashes? Because if there's some, it, it seems to me like they're somehow tied together. If you have stress, maybe not that you have depression, but maybe that's creating an, or, or fueling the fire. Does that have something to do with it? It could very well because the stress response is a hormonal pathway in and of itself. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, I'm 52 as well, and I am going through this now, is if I'm going through my day and I encounter something that aggravates me or my blood starts to boil, I have a hot flash without fail. You know, when my son, who is 16, went for his driver's license test, I was on fire the whole week before. <laughs> um, for, so for me personally, a trigger for my own hot flashes is stress. Um, that might not be the case for everybody. So in people who are experiencing hot flashes, a little bit tangential, but in people experiencing hot flashes, it's really helpful to keep a diary sometimes. What's going on at the time you have your hot flashes? And sometimes that can help you identify triggers. Is it caffeine? Is it stress? Is it you know something else? And that can also lead you to solutions too that don't necessarily have to be hormonal. That's a great tip, actually. That makes perfect sense. You know, keep keep your journal or your diary or your phone nearby. And that's that's cut very, very much of a biohacker perspective is let's figure out what's what really is 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 causing this. So good advice. Um so let's go back to the fact that actually that you ask your doctor or you ask your patients to get mammograms before uh get prescribing any kind of hormone therapy. So that's a good one. I'm going to keep in my pocket. And um, are, what other questions should we be asking either our doctors or ourselves to see if if hormone therapy is is an appropriate approach for us or not? I think, you know, first of all, in awareness of your own personal history. So some of the things that um, go right alongside hormone therapy is the other risk that actually concerns me even more than cancer risk is blood clot risk. So as you mentioned in my intro, I've been a fertility doctor for about 17 years. And so I prescribe more hormones than probably anybody on the planet. And I prescribe them to young, healthy, reproductive age women. And it is really scary when you see a young, healthy, reproductive age woman who I've given estrogen patches to for fertility treatment show up in the emergency room with a pulmonary embolism. This has happened about four times in the last uh, probably six months or so. And a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot that starts somewhere else and then travels to the lung, these are fatal a third of the time. It's a dangerous thing. And that's the stuff that keeps me up at night. And, and the reason why those are a little bit concerning is because because you can't always, but you can't, there's, there's no test that figures out everybody's possible risk factor. There's, like you can't walk into a lab and get a test and say, oh, I have a risk for clots or I don't. Um, testing is very inadequate because there are so many things in the clotting pathway that we just don't know. Because you can have people that have had every test under the sun and who have no family risk factors or personal risk factors show up with a pulmonary embolism. So what you do is you do the best that you can. Um, you you know, take a history of those risk factors, you do appropriate testing. And then, you know, it's, it, it goes with the territory. You know, when we take birth control pills as women, there's an increased risk of blood clots there. It's about one in 10,000. So it's a very small risk, but it's there. And so because it's, you know, a fine line to walk, you always want to discuss that risk of blood clot with your provider before you start any hormone therapy. Your provider may or may not even know to ask that question. And really, every provider should. But as we're learning, there is a real dearth of providers with menopausal expertise. But if you raise the question, they'll know about blood clot risk and they'll be able to discuss that with you. So that is definitely something you want to raise with your providers to talk about your risk of blood clots. The other thing is bone health, okay, or osteoporosis, osteopenia. 
If you've had a personal history of non-traumatic fracture, and that means not the fracture that you're a mountain bike when you crashed into a tree and you broke your arm. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, say maybe you fell down the stairs, a couple of stairs, you tripped and you just fell and you you broke your, you know, your femur or your, the, your humerus, a big arm and the big bone in your arm. That would be like a stress-related fracture. That would be something you want to get a bone density test for. And if you're newly menopausal, you may want to push for that bone density test as a baseline anyway, especially if you have a fracture risk, uh, risk factor. If you are lean, if you are a woman with a body mass index of 21 or less, you have a risk factor for developing osteoporosis. So you may want to get that bone density test sooner rather than later. And then if you turns out, so you get the bone density test and you have osteopenia, which is a decline in bone density, it's not quite as bad as osteoporosis, but you're well on your way. Hormone therapy is very beneficial for that. So bone health, blood clot risk, breast cancer risk, all those things you want to be talking to your provider about when you're making the decision for hormone therapy. Oh, interesting. So the, the, what, if somebody has osteopenia already, uh, it, can the hormone therapy reverse it, like improve your score, or does it just stop it and keep it from degrading quickly? Hormone therapy in and of itself usually slows it down. It is FDA approved for the prevention of osteoporosis, but it doesn't build bone per se. It probably just stems the tide of the decline. Now, you know, hormones are, are one strategy, but the strategies that I advocate more are making sure that you get enough protein in your diet. Menopause is a very catabolic time, meaning that bone is bone density is declining, muscle mass is declining as well. And to prevent fractures, you need strong muscles. You need to be able to move and to you know, uh, have balance, et cetera. And that requires building muscle. So building muscle and building bone requires protein. So protein intake is very, very important. You wanna make sure you're getting enough of that, especially if you're vegan. Mm -hmm. um, where how much protein... would you, st sorry, how much would you say? <clears throat> in terms of well it depends on your activity if you are an athlete if you're an avid recreational athlete that's probably training eight to ten hours or more a week you need about one gram per pound of body weight if you are not in that category probably 0 0.7 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 grams per pound of body weight but if you're an athlete and you're recreationally active then i would say go closer to that one gram per pound of body weight mm -hmm. so yeah. So that would be, so for myself, I weigh about 130 pounds. I get a good 130 grams of, uh, of protein a day and mm -hmm. that can be in any form. Um, so that's important. Um, you know, weight bearing movements, you know, lifting weights, you know, I know lifting weights. If, <clears throat> if you're in this age group, you, you know, you grew up in the eighties when women didn't do such things. <laughs> um, but they really truly is, this is a huge benefit. If you follow Stacey Sims, you know what the benefits are. And I do recommend following her. She, she knows the stuff inside and out. So doing weight bearing exercise, lifting weights, um, mixing up your plyometric movements. Those are like jumping movements. All of those things are non-medical ways or lifestyle ways that you can help to stem the tide of the loss and potentially even improve your bone density. But hormone therapy alone is not something that's going to build bone. It just might help slow the acceleration of the loss. Mm. So yeah, I agree with you. It definitely for so many other, other benefits as well is to get that exercise in the strength training and and impact the plyometrics. All of this is, is, is great advice. And I always, to my opinion is generally like you can't out, out, um, I don't know, outsmart your body just doing hormone therapy, right? I think we we still need to get the whole foundation of, of proper nutrition and good exercise and sleep and stress management and all that stuff. I mean, just like you said, even perhaps managing your stress may just alleviate some of the, the symptoms as well. So um, really good, good, good advice. So HRT is just kind of like the added, like the supplement yeah. on top of all the other stuff that you should be doing. Um, yeah. I mean, when I treat patients, I go after lifestyle first, you know, that's mm -hmm. the first thing I do before I even have the conversation with them about hormone therapy, because any therapy that I use is going to work so much better if you've already optimized the lifestyle. And what might happen is if you optimize the lifestyle, they may not even need the hormones. 
Mm. And that's really a win if, if you don't need to take medication. I'm one that, you know, if I, if, if my head's got to be ready to explode before I take an Advil. Um, I'm not <laughs> one that likes to take medication. Um, I like to deal with it as naturally as I can. And uh, most of the time I can. But, you know, when I get that migraine, of course, I'll take the ibuprofen. But, you know, because, you know, medications have side effects. They do have risks. And if you don't need them, then why take the risk? So I approach it first with lifestyle, more holistic stuff. And then I use it as an adjunct, um, you know, just to help really gain relief for patients if they need it. No, that's great. It, it, um, it's so rare that you find a doctor that knows as much as you do and could advocate that. It's usually just throwing stuff at us and, and just hope for the best. So I'm wondering then if you think at all, if, you know, we I've interviewed other other hormone experts and doctors and people who... Who, talking about HRT, and some of them say that uh, having the decline in the hormones or having your estrogen shot and progesterone gone and no testosterone is puts you at risk also for certain diseases. So in fact, those are the, the real pro, you know pro pro uh, uh, hormone therapy people, and they would say no, it's protective, and you you you're putting yourself at risk by not having your hormones in balance or having them all shot. What do you think about that? It's a lot to unpack with that one. Um, the first thing is yes, when uh, menopause happens and we and our hormones change. Uh, we are at risk for more things. We're at risk for bone density loss. We're at risk for muscle mass loss, joint stability, dislocations. We're at risk for developing cardiovascular disease. There was an article that just came out in um, Menopause, which is the North American Menopause Society Journal, uh, specifically about cardiovascular risk after menopause. But that doesn't mean that you need hormones to fix it. Again, it goes back to lifestyle. Get on the treadmill and do some HIIT training. Get on the weights and do some muscle mass building. If you know, you also also the weight gain and the metabolic changes. Well, guess what? You know that decline in muscle health is largely responsible for those metabolic changes because the number one user of glucose in the body is the skeletal muscle. And if you keep your skeletal muscles healthy, then your metabolism is going to have a better chance of being healthy. So I agree with my colleagues that yes, menopause does bring with it an increased risk of a lot of things, but the solution is not necessarily hormone therapy. You got to start with optimizing your lifestyle because the hormones aren't magic. The pills are not magic. If you don't have that foundation of good health, it's going to be very difficult to get anything to work. So that's the first uh, comment. The second comment is this narrative where you put yourself at risk by not going on them. Well, I think that's a blanket situation statement that you can't apply to everybody. Because again, I'll go back to that risk benefit conversation you need to have with your doctor. Maybe you're someone, you're someone who the risk of hormone therapy outweighs the benefits of hormone therapy. And the benefits of hormone therapy are only in very specific populations. For example, the population of women who have hot flashes severe enough to take them to the doctor to want treatment, they have a specific biology that correlates with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. We're finding that these women who have hot flashes are different from women who do not. And so you see a benefit to all cause mortality and cardiovascular risk when you treat those women with hormone therapy. But when you treat women with hormone therapy who don't have those symptoms, you don't see the same benefit. And that's what the studies are showing more and more. So to make a blanket statement about that, that everybody needs this is just in my humble opinion, not the best approach because every individual is different. Every individual has a risk benefit profile and hormone therapy is not for everyone. It, uh, it does wonders for many people, but they have to be the right people with the right indication after their lifestyle has been optimized. Mm. So then that would make sense if you are optimizing your health, then you're already just lowering your risk of all cause mortality and all these diseases and things like that. So um, that's a good thing anyway. So if you got that optimized and the hormones are, I mean, even if the, so if the hormones are shot, but you're still, you know, active and healthy and doing all the, the right things supposedly, then uh, the, the hormones, I guess it's a matter of balance as well, even though okay, we say they're shot, but you, you still have some hormones, right? I mean, even though they're mostly 
mostly gone, but are, they're still there, aren't they? Of course, they, they, they are. They're there in different concentrations. And so mm -hmm. here's the thing that I want to highlight, too, because this narrative is out there. And, and this kind of like defines our experience as women in this age group who have had to live through the 80s, where everybody is telling you how they think you should be. You should be skinny. You shouldn't let your thighs touch when you walk. You should behave a certain way. OK, now they're trying to tell us, well, your hormones should be that of a 30 year old. Well, no, because at menopause, biology dials down those hormones. When your testosterone is low, your estrogen is low, your progesterone low, this is normal for 50 and 50 plus for, for people in menopause. This is normal. It, it's, it's silly to hold the 50 year old to the standards of the 30 year old, whether it's aesthetics or biology. It's just not, it doesn't make sense. And so what you need to do is you need not to look at, okay, we have to fix these hormones so that they're more like they were when I was 30. No, you have to live within this normal range. Nature has programmed it this way for a reason. We just need to live within it. And that reason is, is that if we do tend to have estrogen when we're older, like over 60, that's when you find the risk of dementia increases, the risk of cardiovascular events increases, risk of blood clots increases. So there is a window where hormones are good for us and there is a window where it's not. And nature has programmed it that way for, the reason, for a reason. So you wanna be able to live within your new biology. That doesn't mean surrender to it. It means understand it and optimize it. Mm, well said. Oh my gosh, we need to have more soundboards like this. You'd be sending these messages because as we are in, at least in the Western world, this with the media, social media and everything, we we are chasing youth and uh, me included, you know, I'm, I'm, we're in between, we're not, young, but we're not old and you know, these we're stuck in the middle. And I think this transition is so hard and it's so hard to accept, but if we could just change uh, the narrative a little bit, we could accept it much more easily and just not struggle and not fight and, and just go with the flow. I think that's really, really good advice. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. I mean, I, I know when I turned 40, I, I got really sick of society telling me what I should do. Um, you know, I, <laughs> because it really didn't make sense. I, I think the most the most fun one that I came in in in, in contact with this uh, on the feisty menopause Facebook uh, group, there was some post out there about some, I don't know, Fruit Loop thought leader that says that, you know, if you're over 50, you shouldn't have long hair. OK, so <laughs> now my hair comes down. I, it's up right now, but my hair comes down to my waist when I don't have it up. And, mm -hmm. you know, you got you got these 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 people, these these think tank people who who set the status quo that say that always are putting it, it into the standard of the of the 25, 30 year old. OK, you have to have the flat stomach. You have to have the smooth skin. You can't have any gray hairs. And then when I have something that I had when I was 30, they want me to cut my hair. It's like, okay, so you want me to fill this status quo when I was 30 for every other thing that I'm losing and I have no control over, but the one thing I have that I had when I was 30, now you want me to cut my hair? It, it just is the ridiculousness of these, these elements of the status quo that somebody somewhere along the line set. And we just kind of have to lay down the gauntlet and just stop listening and capitulating to it. You know, we just need to understand our biology, live within it, and optimize it every step of the way. It's just a detour. It's not a decline. It's a detour. And uh, you know, we can we can be our healthiest, you know, most vital selves well into our 80s, 90s. My mother's 93, and she's like the most vital person I've ever met. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, you know, all, all of these narratives out there, they can be very destructive and, and sometimes they're actually ridiculous and funny if you really listen mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, is, this is why I love this community, the feisty menopause community. It, I, I think it's very empowering. And I, when I first found this community, the message that I got was menopause is, is not a time to slow down, but it's a time to speed up and do what you want to be doing. And I love mm -hmm. that because I've had so many people tell me after I'm injured or I'm, you know, something's happening and I go, well, maybe you need to slow down. And I'm just, you know, if you, if you listen to that too much, you start to believe it. 
And, uh, and I really, you know, that's the society telling us what to do again, but I just, mm -hmm. that's why I, I gravitate to your community as well. So we need more people in that we need to resonate this. So we're, 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 we're resonating that as well. So, uh, we have like five more minutes before I open the mic and I barely got through any of my questions, but I, I, I would love to hear a little bit more, um, about the testing you said, you, you mentioned you, you, of course you screen, you make sure that they, they, don't, they don't have any of these risks, but they also have a mammogram. Are there any other tests that we should be asking our doctor for that you run yourself? And, and if so, which ones? It really depends on the symptoms that somebody is presenting with. Like if it's hot flashes, which is very common, I always do a thyroid screen because that could be another reason why people are having a heat intolerance sort of episode. Uh, you always want to do a thyroid screen. You know, if um, trying to think of some other things, there isn't, I, I can't say that there is a blanket panel of testing that I do for everybody. Um, I think it really depends on symptoms, but you know, the, some of the important things that you always want to keep tabs on at this age is cholesterol. You want to get a cholesterol panel done because lipids change after menopause because the decline in estrogen causes our total cholesterol to increase sometimes, sometimes triglycerides can be impacted. Um, that's another thing that you'll want to talk to your doctor about with hormone therapy is that hormone therapy can also affect lipids. So total cholesterol panel is good. Thyroid is good. Um, if you have risk factors, like I mentioned, a bone density scan may not be unreasonable to ask for that. And you always want to take a cardiovascular risk assessment. Um, you know, you want to, you, you want to know what your, what your risk factors are. And there's actually the American Heart Association has a tool. If you go to the American Heart Association website, there's actually a tool that anybody can use that calculates your five and 10 year risk of a cardiovascular event. It's the same tool that most physicians use. And then you yourself can empower yourself and say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to assess my own risk. And, uh, you know, so those are some of the things that you, you want to mention to your doctor. Also, screen for diabetes. You want to get a fasting sugar and probably a hemoglobin A1C just to see if there's any pre-diabetes going on there. And again, diabetes can increase after menopause because of the metabolism changes that go along with the hormone changes. So those are the areas yeah. I typically hit with everybody. So you would do those, and you mentioned that they can affect lipid levels, for example, cholesterol. In a, in, you mean in a, in a good way or a bad way? And the same thing for insulin, in a good way or a bad way? What, hormones? In gen, hormone in therapy the, in the general? Hormone, hormone therapy, <clears throat> yeah. Hormone, and again, it depends on the age of the person. It depends on what their baseline um, biology is. Are they obese? Are they you know, of normal weight? There's a lot of asterisks there. Uh, but in general, like with lipid levels, um, the hormone therapy can sometimes increase triglyceride levels. So if you're somebody with super high triglycerides, that might be made worse by hormone therapy. However, if you do a transdermal or like a skin patch or a cream hormone therapy, that will have less effect on your lipids than an oral pill because the oral pill has to pass through the liver before it does anything. And when it does that, that can jack up your cholesterol parameters. So um, skin type preparations, patches and creams may be a little bit better um, on your cholesterol. Uh, there isn't really an increased risk on diabetes, although there might be, I'd have to go back and check the guidelines, but there might be an attenuation of um, developing diabetes with hormone therapy. But again, it really depends on where your starting point is. I would maybe guess, and this is just me just guessing, if you are sleeping poorly and then your hormone therapy helps you sleep better because you're not having the hot flashes, yeah. then maybe the insulin uh, you know, will be regulated better because with a poor night's sleep, you're already mm -hmm. putting yourself more at, at, at uh, risk for it blood yeah. sugar dysregulation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Sometimes, you know, if you get those hot flashes during sleep and you can fix the hot flashes and then you fix the sleep, then there's a whole cascade of things that can come from getting better sleep. So yeah. um, for some people, that's a huge, huge issue and a huge win for them. So you don't, you don't, wouldn't test for progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone through blood or a Dutch test? No, not for menopausal women. For somebody who's younger than 45, who may be a little younger than I would expect, who's having these, uh, you know, who's having hot flashes, then I may check those things. But every 45-year-old woman or higher is going to have abnormal labs because, like I said, that's normal. That is normal for what is happening at that age. So 
you know, whether you have an FSH of 100 or not over the age of 45, it doesn't change what I do and it doesn't really matter. We know every pretty much every 45 year old woman is in perimenopause and her labs are going to be all over the place. So it doesn't drive treatment. But I do check those things in someone who's a little younger where it may be something else, but it may also be premature menopause or early menopause. Um, so in the younger population, I would check more of these levels, but over 45, they really don't help very much. So you don't need to check at, even after they start taking the therapy to make sure they don't go over the limit of, I don't know, estrogen or progesterone in, there in are their none. own blood. There are none. The North American Menopause Society statement on hormone therapy published in 2022 and all of the statements published uh, a decade before that uh, say that you do not check levels to monitor therapy. The way you monitor therapy is you talk to your patient. Are your hot flashes gone? <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. great. You're in the right range. You don't have to be checking levels. The only levels I would check would be if I had somebody on testosterone. Now, that is not FDA approved for any indication in women. However, there are there's good data behind treating libido with testosterone. Um, so what you have to look out, look out for for testosterone is that you are in a safe range. You don't wanna be above reproductive age female range or else then you are at risk for um, side effects like you know, uh, female uh, temporal balding, uh, male temporal balding patterns and voice changes, things like that can be irreversible. So I would check a testosterone level for anybody I happen to have on testosterone therapy, but not for standard estrogen progesterone hormone therapy. That is based on symptoms. Mm, okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. What about, so the, the Dutch test, everybody talks about, you have to see if your estrogen is metabolizing down the wrong pathway and it could be bad. So maybe you shouldn't be taking estrogen because of, of these factors. What do you, that, that isn't even um, mentioned in the uh, guidelines. We don't even pay attention to it. Okay. So there was no, no, there was absolutely no evidence in the peer reviewed allopathic literature that suggests that we need to worry about that. Wow. Well, then they just saved a lot of money for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those things are, expensive. you know, and, that, and that's another point. That's another point. I mean, right now there is this wave of other types of providers who are checking levels constantly and patients are paying unnecessary money to do that. And they're making money on that. And the other advice I give to women is that wherever you go to get your treatment, you need to find out if the practice is, is directly financially benefiting from the therapy they're prescribing you. Are they like they making it in their back room of their office? And if they are directly making a profit on the, uh, the labs that they've drawn, because that's a conflict of interest. And like I said, in the allopathic literature and all of the guidelines that are set out by the menopause experts all over the world are saying you don't need to do these levels to monitor therapy. You're wasting your money. Wow. Okay. Well then, yes, lots of money being saved now. I mm -hmm. love that. Okay. So I'm going to open the mics to everybody, but before we do, I'd love to ask where can our listeners work with you? How do you work with them? Um, and do you work with any people in other countries as well? Cause we have an international audience here. Oh, sure. Yeah. So you can check out my website. It's www.drcarlad. So it's drcarlad.com. So that's my website. Um, I do consultations right now. They are not medical consultations. I am happy to do health and wellness consultations because right now my practice is in transition. I'm going to be opening up my own practice um, in uh, the beginning of 2025. And right now I'm kind of in a transition phase. Uh, so I can't take people on officially as patients and prescribe therapy for them. But what I can do is a health and wellness consultation where we can talk about all the same things. I can give you my suggestions and my take. And then you can then you get a written summary and you can take that to your providers, your coaches, your trainers, and you can raise those talking points with them. I'm just kind of providing guidance on what questions you may want to ask and what things you may want to discuss with the doctors who are responsible for your care. So I am doing consultations like that, and you can contact me through the website. Oh, great. I'll have all the details in all the links in the show notes. So let's open up the mics. Um, I, I know that Magdalena always has great questions. Um, let's start with you, and then we'll, we'll move on. And unmute. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm a little bit confused listening to this podcast today because 
I think I, I'm the representative of somebody who is thinking or seeing the things differently. I will be 58 this year and I'm on hormone replacement therapy with bioidentical hormones already for 10 years. I am following this protocol nonstop 10 years. I don't know what would your, um, how to say, views be about it, is it good or not? But I feel very good and my levels of progesterone, uh, estradiol and testosterone are much higher now when I will be 55 comparing to, let me say, eight years ago. I uh, would say that I have a little bit different view than you. I would like uh, to look, uh, to feel healthy, to look good, to, to be capable of doing many things older people cannot. And I think that um, bioidentical hormone therapy can help with it. So I am pro to the views that we should use tools and um, supplementations and some protocols to help us doing this because different doctors are seeing things differently. Zora, if you remember, for example, Dr. Yurf explained a little bit different way that people, women start um, losing hormones, um, the levels of hormones are going down after 2025. And it's like normal that we would like to feel like uh, in our 30s, 40s. And I agree. I don't want to feel um, with all these hot flashes, to be tired, to, to have insomnia. And actually, I can be happy to say that I have never um, had any, uh, I have never had an experience so far to feel what does it mean to be like menopausal? I don't know because I started at my 47, 48 uh, when I was not menopausal yet. And I don't have this kind of experience. And I think this is good. Now I don't know what is your, uh, what is your view of it. What would you well, say so, about this? Well, so far, you haven't said anything that I disagree with. Everything that you just talked about is in line with the message that I've given today. I prescribe bioidentical hormones all the time. That's what I prescribe for hormone therapy is bioidentical hormones. And I want everybody to feel as good as they possibly can feel. Being in menopause doesn't mean you feel horrible. It means you're going through some transitions, but there are ways to not feel horrible. You have found those ways for yourself, and that's fantastic. We're all in the same boat here, and there's nothing so that maybe, you said maybe that I, I misunderstood with. it. Maybe I misunderstood it because I understood like it's better to try with um, the way of living, with the food, with exercising. I'm already doing all of this all of my life. I am. Yeah, so you're already there. Lifestyle. You're, Maybe you're wouldn't be needed. Maybe I could just say I'm 50 years old. Uh, I'm menopausal. It's like normal. I don't want to be normal if there are tools that I can help myself thing. feeling younger. But you are normal. You're a, you are a normal menopausal woman who has found your secret sauce. We should all be more like you. You've been living a healthy lifestyle most of your life. You found some uh treatments that are working fantastic for you bravo okay thank you then i obviously misunderstood something i i thought that something i'm doing something wrong because i started to, uh, too early or whatever so i'm happy <laughs> i'm on yeah. the right way yeah no you've you found your secret sauce that's fantastic i'm happy for you super uh then another question is how are you testing the hormone levels with saliva with urine or with blood tests this i didn't understand very well, well when i check hormone levels it's uh, it's a diagnostic it's to exclude chronic disease i don't check hormones to monitor therapy unless i'm doing testosterone um so i use my patient's symptoms if they are feeling good then i know i'm in the right range um, there is absolutely no indication in any of the allopathic literature that checking hormones after hormone therapy and menopause does any good. Uh, so that's why I don't do it. I don't need to. My patients feel good on the therapy that I give them, and I don't need to check levels. I do check testosterone in people I treat with testosterone because I need to make sure they're in a safe range. Uh, but with estrogen and progesterone, there's no need to do that. 
that's interesting. I have never heard something like that. I will uh, refer you... you to the document. It is the uh, North American Menopause Society position on hormone therapy from 2022. It was just updated. That goes into great detail about the research, decades of research and the guidelines around care surrounding menopause hormone therapy and monitoring treatment. So that single document is a great review of all of the literature and the guidelines that the American, the menopause societies have put forth. Not just North American Menopause Society, but the British Medical Society and the Royal College of OBGYNs. They have issued a similar statement. So if you look at those position statements, you will find everything that I have said backed up in those statements. Super, great. Would you recommend it's good for the body to do some pause, let me say, to stop for a certain period of time and then go on? Or we can uh, take and follow these protocols all the time because we're you getting can... older every day. Yeah. So one of the new things that came out in the guidelines and the research is that there is no set limit on women taking hormone therapy. And what the limit should be set on is like, say, for instance, you're on hormone therapy for a long time and all of a sudden you either have a breast cancer diagnosis or you got a blood clot in, in a pulmonary embolism. That would be an indication to stop because now the risk benefit profile has shifted. Now the risk of the therapy has become greater than the benefits. And so as I update people's medical history, I make sure that that risk benefit equation is still intact and I will keep them on it if they are feeling good. Super. You mentioned mammogram. What do you think about thermography? Thermography, because I, I've heard a um, few doctors said that mammography can be actually harmful, can even cause some kind of cancers. Um, um, I don't have any evidence or peer-reviewed evidence to suggest that mammograms cause breast cancer, and I don't know anything about thermography, so that's something I can't speak to. Okay, and now, thank you. The last question, what would you say about adding uh, I, I, IGF-1, a uh, growth hormone? I'll tell you what I think about growth hormone. First of all, in the United States, we cannot prescribe growth hormone off-label anymore. We used to be able to do it 10 years ago. We used to use it as part of fertility treatment protocols, but now we can be imprisoned and fined if we prescribe it off-label. So prescribing growth hormone uh, is not something that I can do unless I'm treating it for an FDA indication. However, there is a supplement out there called Cerovital. It also goes under the name Growth Factor 9. And what this is, it's a combination of amino acids and an herb. I don't know what the herb is. It's proprietary. Where this, this, this formulation can increase your own natural production of growth hormone. And this is something that has made its way into the aging space and even into the infertility space now that we can't prescribe growth hormone off label. So that there is something to that. I do believe there's something to that. I actually take cerovital and growth factor nine myself. Um, I've been taking it for a long time. So this is like empirically, a supplement. It's, a supplement. it's a supplement. It's a supplement. <laughs> um, I don't know what countries it's available in, but it's called cerovital, S-E-R-O-V-I-T-A-L. And um, it's been around a long time. And uh, I, I do take it myself. I think it helps with sleep. I think it helps with skin. Um, and uh, so I think there's something to it. I don't have a lot of literature that I can say backs that up, but this is just one of those things. I decided to try it. It works for me and I take it. Great info. That's something I have never heard before. I put mm -hmm. it into my notes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for very welcome. All, all the answers. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for the questions. Great questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to let you go. We have run out of time. I I think we need a part two because we still have plenty of questions. I am so grateful that you took the time for us. I will have the links to your Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, website uh, in the show notes because they change all the time, but definitely the website drcarla d.com. So uh, in case you want to go right away, you can go and do that. The blog is fabulous, athleticaging.blog. Any last words for a woman going through menopause before I let you go? I always tell women, be good to yourselves. Don't make your body the enemy. Your body has been with you all these years and it's changing and it needs you right now. So be good to it. Be good, for, be good to yourself and, uh, and treat yourself well and your body will treat you well back. 
Oh, thank you so much. Great advice. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful day or night or morning, wherever you guys are listening. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll hopefully see you again next time. Take care. Absolutely, Zora. Thank you. And yeah, just, uh, you know, send me a, a, a note and we can put another date in a calendar.